Uh, today uh, uh, we we cover chapter four, and uh, and chapter four has to do with the uh, what I call the Jewish Christian Islamic law or the Sharia. As, as you know, uh, there's been a lot of um, talk and uh, media coverage and uh, states uh, concerned about the Sharia. Uh, actually, what we want to focus on here is the meaning of the Christian Islamic law or the Sharia, and then uh, focus more on its contribution to uh, riba free banks. Um, in uh, doing this, uh, we hope that first we can throw some light on, on how the law is developed not much different from the way the Jewish law is developed or the Talmud and Halakha, and also not much different from the canonical laws are developed in the Catholic Church. I am not aware of such institutions in other denominations in the Christian theology and also the Mormon Church. Uh, I have checked with uh, the Mormon Church and to my knowledge, most of their edicts and most of their canons uh, come through revelation to the president who actually disseminates them uh, to his subject. As to the evangelical movement, it is mostly uh, populist uh, and based on a, a church leader like Joel Osteen and, and others who would have their own translation and meanings of different prophecies of the Bible, and they are more interested in prophecies. And who is the prophet? Certain way of life. Um, here uh, in the Talmud, or the Halakha, uh, which is the Jewish uh, body of, of laws by which people live by, or the Catholic Church, which is, or the Lutheran Church, actually, I had a meeting in Texas with some of the leaders of the Lutheran Church, and um, they actually shared with us uh, their edicts and so on. They, they, have been, uh, they have been quiet for some time. Now I think they're waking up because they found that uh, the evangelical movement is using uh, the fundamentals of what Martin Luther wrote, and it expanded. It is expanded. Uh, direction that they want to bring back, uh, not to control, but to, to manage. But that is said, um, the, the process that we're going to go through will, will help us all uh, understand what this business of Sharia is all about. Uh, to let you know, uh, most of the Muslims hear the word Sharia, and they think it's a very important thing, so, but many of them don't know where it's coming from. Um, um, it's exactly like the canons in the Catholic Church uh, for a Catholic and, and like for, for an average uh, Jewish person. Um, the reason I include this chapter is that one of the important aspects in the Beth Free Bank is the source of the edict that would allow this bank to operate according to the law. And I wanted to um, go through uh, some historic facts uh, about uh, Riba free banking. I, I wanted to um, introduce you to the uh, tedious and meticulous and detailed process uh, that a qualified scholar uh, in the faith uses to come up with an edict. And I, I, I want the people of uh, the faith, of any faith, uh, to to understand uh, the process that uh, these uh, very uh, respected scholars in whatever faith they belong to go through. Why? Because uh, you need to ask uh, if they tell you this is forbidden. Uh, you need to ask on what basis you have reached that decision. What are your references? Uh, what, ask yourself, who are they? Are they educated? Are they trained? Are they prepared to make such decisions? Unfortunately, nowadays, the only preparation in a large number of cases is a Hollywood-style preparation. 
as a garb, people dress in. They may be a beard that can be long, can be short, can be uh, nicely dressed, and so on. And, and that adds in this halo of uh, adding credibility uh, because we live in a television uh, era whereby the looks are more important than the content. Uh, so I, I encourage you to, as, as students of this subject and people who are interested in knowing the truth, to ask, you know, uh, where did you go to school and what did you study? And uh, some people will be offended uh, from my uh, experience or you ask them this, but they shouldn't be offended because you want to know uh, what kind of capabilities they have and, uh, and so on. And uh, as we discussed uh, before, uh, the Sharia or the Islamic law, I really like to call it the Judeo-Christian Islamic law because it is the product of, it is the product of the extension of what Moses taught and, uh, and of what Prophet Jesus thought and what Prophet Muhammad thought, all together built in layers, uh, one on top of the other. And, and it's very important to note that when Jesus came, he did not discredit Moses. That was, he actually reinforced Moses' teachings. And when Muhammad came, he did not discredit Jesus, he did not discredit Moses, but on the contrary, he actually reinforced the teachings of Moses and Jesus and produced for the first time the canonical laws that actually uh, are used in business today in different form or another. Now, uh, I also wanted to give you a little uh, historic background. As you know, the Europeans were very interested in uh, importing spices from India. The reason for that was that spices preserved food, preserved meat, preserved goods, and, and so they, they increased the shelf life of these food products uh, because they did not have refrigerators at the time. So they started uh, their navigation routes into India, and while they were doing this, they had to go through the Middle East, and um, so the Middle East became very important, and India was important because India at the time was ruled by different sultans in different regions who happened to be Muslims. So the British, in particular, got interested into uh, India and the route that navigated into India. Now the French, of course, because they were the two major powers at the time, were in their heels and they were more interested in uh, the Middle East. Napoleon, in particular, was uh, very interested in the old pharaonic uh, history and Egypt and the surrounding areas, and he took a personal interest in that. And when he went to Egypt, actually, uh, he knew that the Al Azhar University, which is like the Catholic Church headquarters in Rome, uh, was in charge. So uh, the, the well known story was that he had the Al Azhar garb uh, and he dressed up in it, went well to the mosque, and he said that I am pronouncing myself as a Muslim. And as a matter of fact, his chief staff, uh, before he left, uh, got married to the daughter of the Grand Sheikh or the Grand Priest of Al-Azhar uh, at the time. And uh, that's part of the history. But anyway, they came in and they uh, developed, of course, the conduits, the channels to uh, have a banking system that would help them buy and sell and transfer money, and that banking system was based on a completely new set of rules and regulations that were riba-based. Now, the local Muslim business community uh, did not like that, and they, what they did because of their uh, weaknesses, uh, both economic and, of course, we do not have much um, uh, to talk about as far as development, as far as navigation, as far as sophistication. So what they did, they started shrinking. Same thing happened actually in China. Same thing happened in Southeast Asia when the Europeans went there. They, they didn't know what was going on because they discovered they had, they had been asleep for 400, 500, 600 years. So they just withdrew and they did not do business with these banks. And, and most of them actually uh, decided to do business between
between themselves. So they could not benefit from the expansive potential of growing capital, attracting capital, and so on and so forth. So uh, with, with their exposure for the first time to uh, the colonial powers and what they have, uh, they discovered that, uh, that they were asleep for 600 years. They said, oh my God, you know. And, and what they were uh, treated with a shock of intimidation. They were really intimidated and they didn't know um, what to do. Uh, they, they found that they have not caught up with the 20th century. And my translation of colonization, despite the fact that this may not be a popular view, is that the God Almighty in his infinite wisdom, uh, when he wants to shake people up and wake them up, he would send them people who have been awakened a long time ago to let them wake up. Uh, what happened in Iraq is a wake-up call in Iraq. What's happening in Afghanistan is a wake-up call in Afghanistan. So people would stand up and say, oh, my God, what's going on? We got to catch up with it. It can be brutal, unfortunately. It can be devastating, unfortunately. But, you know, things have to happen. But anyway, what happened has happened. And of course, there were a lot of voices of dissent because many of the religious leaders kept telling the Muslims in these areas that dealing in riba is prohibited. As a matter of fact, until today, until today, uh, in the banking industry, in the business that I'm in, at the bank of which you're at Lariba, when they hear that there is a bank involved, they start raising an eyebrow. They have the sensitivity of getting into a bank. Rashida, uh, the bank, oh, I don't want to deal with the bank. So I wish we can change the name, but, you know, it's very difficult because, you know, it, it, it's tough in a society which is highly structured and regulated. But um, when the book was published, a dear friend of mine uh, from the royal family of Kuwait, uh, uh, he bought the book, and I haven't had a contact with him for about 15 or 20 years. And here I am receiving an email from him saying, I read your book, and it's amazing. And he took it upon himself to translate it in Arabic and publish it in, in a newspaper there. But his point was that, you know, this riba free banking movement has unlocked billions of dollars of the average citizens who refused to deal with the banks, and they kept their money in the pillow and the mattress. Uh, now, one thing, some, one thing happened before the oil price jump was an, an Egyptian uh, engineer who went to Germany uh, to study engineering and uh, got married to, an, to a German wife who is actually a friend of mine. His name is Dr. Ahmed Al-Najjar. And Ahmed Al-Najjar actually came back to his uh, city where he came from in the Delta. And he found that uh, uh, poor Egyptian farmers don't have money to buy seeds, don't have money to buy small little pumps and so on. And he was very impressed by the uh, modern, you know, Germany has a huge cooperative movement whereby uh, people in a small uh, agricultural city would make a cooperative in which they put in their savings and then they take the money to finance different needs of the site. And he started the first ever RF bank uh, in, uh, in modern history, in the 20th, 20th century. And, uh, and that actually grew up to be a significant movement. With the oil price jump in 1973, uh, there was a huge concern about uh, the absorptive capacity of the oil producing countries. By absorptive capacity, uh, it was meant that the economies of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and Dubai and uh, Emirates were not sophisticated enough to handle all of this money. So what to do with this money? So Ahmed and Najjar got together to advise uh, King Faisal of Saudi Arabia uh, to start a riba free uh, banking movement and that was the beginning of the banking movement that is based on the uh, Judeo-Christian Islamic law. So, uh, <laughs> but then came a big problem. Uh, well, we talk about Islamic banks, but uh, how do we do Islamic banks? Uh, what should be the rules? What should be 
the regulations, what is the definition of riba, and so on. Uh, they relied on <coughs> two major sources. Uh, one source was in Egypt, and one source was in Pakistan. In Pakistan, there was a very well-known uh, reformist uh, movement leader. His name was Abu Ala al Maududi, and uh, M A U D U D I Maududi. And Abu Ala Maududi actually wrote about this casually as as part of his huge uh, master plan for uh, reforming. Uh, the Muslim countries and, and trying to make him wake up and join the rest of the world. And he wrote about uh, Islamic banking and Islamic finance, and he said that riba is prohibited, and the meaning of a riba-free transaction is participation in profit and loss. Uh, and that word has been sticking until today in the minds of many of the people uh, in, in actually both the uh, Arabic-speaking countries and the Urdu and Hindi-speaking countries, uh, uh, because it it has uh, reduced the whole concept into two words: particip participation and profit and loss. And Mike Abdelati can attest to that, and uh, Maria and any of the participants. Anwar, do you participate in profit and loss? Yes, you ask you that, right? That's, that, but but the interesting thing is, we only want to know about participation in the loss. They never talk to you about the participation in the profit, right? <laughs> because they want to make sure that if they lose, that somebody will take the loss away from them. And uh, I'm sure they ask you the same question, Alex, uh, when you talk to Mandrada, right? So, so that thing was one of the aspects, actually, which is impeding uh, the growth. And I, my projection in the future is that the new generations, uh, that is, sitting around this table and in Pasadena and people that you deal with uh, will slowly forget this big hang-up. The second part was Al-Azhar University, which was the only uh, structured seminary uh, uh, in the Sunni school of thought. The other seminary that is highly structured is the Shia school of thought, both in Najaf, which is the original one. Najaf is in Iraq, which is the original one. And then the one that was developed afterwards to speak Persian is the one of Qum in, in Persia. So in, in uh, Al-Azhar University, uh, they wrote extensively on uh, this business. Why? Because in the early 1900s, there was a movement to start an Egyptian bank uh, because uh, Barclays Bank uh, came to Egypt to take care of the needs of the building of the Suez Canal. And uh, so they got exposed to Barclays Bank. Barclays of today, at the time, they opened up a branch in Egypt that was the first ever riba-based bank. So the Egyptians said, why can't we have a bank? Then the scholar said that it is prohibited, and that was the beginning of a whole uh, research movement in Al-Azhar on that subject. Um, as a matter of fact, the most sophisticated work on, in that field comes from Al-Azhar. And as a matter of fact, the scholars that have led the movement in Malaysia came from Al-Azhar University. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, but there is nothing like that practiced in Egypt because they have been suppressed and nationalized by the Egyptian government, which is a military government, from 1954 until uh, January 25th, 2011. And uh, so you, you know, so the scholars of Azhar would would graduate uh, hundreds, of, uh, literally hundreds of thousands. There is at least forty thousand Malaysian students studying at Al Azhar University uh, branches all over Egypt. Uh, when I go to Malaysia, you, you meet all of these Malaysians uh, who actually speak to Egyptian dialects from different parts of Egypt, which is a very impressive uh, thing to see. But they all. Uh, were uh, ended up in Malaysia and uh, developed what actually uh, is branded the most sophisticated riba-free banking movement in the world in Malaysia, and then later on Indonesia and so on and so forth. But um, so I think enough of history, and uh, I want you to read uh, the book. Uh, so King Faisal started the Islamic Development Bank and. Uh, 
and then the rest is history. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. There, there, there's a lot of, of uh, and I think the future of Azure will be uh, much more enhanced because uh, there will be more focus on the quality of education, so on and so forth. Um, if you're asking where do I find the time to summarize books and stuff, I want to share with you this. I, I, for instance, this particular thing is based on the book, and it was produced sitting at the airport waiting for airplanes, sitting inside the airplane doing my work. I'm sharing this with you because please do not sit doing nothing. Do something, right? Challenge yourself. Read the book, uh, do a presentation, do something, but do not sit doing nothing. Your mind will sleep, and when your mind sleeps, it's very hard to wake it up again, right? So this whole book actually was typed one hand, you've seen me typing, right? <laughs> Not two hands, one hand with finger typing uh, while sitting on airplanes for 11 hours and uh, sitting at airports waiting for airplanes for three hours and four hours, uh, traveling. Uh, my wife would be sleeping from the jet lag. I'd go down in the lobby and type saying, don't let your mind sleep, all right? Because it's not, it's what a waste of time. I wish, I wish we have time to do things, but, um, uh, uh, be it as it may. So all that was known at the time of the beginning of the movement were two things. First, interest cannot be charged. And, uh, and uh, any contract that, is, uh, that involves the paying of interest, the charging of interest, the witnessing of interest contracts are prohibited and will never be forgiven. Actually, the same law in Judaism and in Catholicism, early Catholicism. Now, the second part is uh, what uh, Sheikh Abad al Maududi has uh, put together, and that is the parties in a commercial transaction must participate in the profit and loss. Now, now here came the challenge. Uh, now we have uh, an Islamic bank, let us say, or river free bank, and we say this is a river free bank. So how do we operate? They don't know much about banking. The scholars know nothing about banking, and uh, so they started. And I personally was involved in this process. So we started bringing uh, bankers, uh, river based bankers, and scholars together, and put them in the same room. So uh, we would explain to them uh, what are the aspects of uh, a certain transaction, like opening a checking account. And then we'll ask them what's their opinion. Then they'll ask questions and we'll give answers. And we slowly developed what is today known as the foundation of RF banking uh, edicts and laws and so on and so forth. And of course, in the beginning, it was very fundamental. Um, what is a checking account? By the way, the word check comes from the word suck, and suck means a promissory note in the original Arabic language. That's where the word check came from and uh, went into Europe, and it was used in the banking setup, and then back uh, now in, in, in the free banking. Now, so. This was the first beginning, exposing the bankers to the scholars. But then we faced another problem, language. So, uh, because most of the scholars in the Arabic-speaking countries speak Arabic only, and most of the international bankers spoke English, because we wanted to have, and, and frankly, the people that insisted adamantly the people who have the hardest head amongst uh, Muslims in the world are the Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi communities. They say, this is what we want, and they make sure they get it, right? And di different from the Arabic-speaking, who I think have been more, more um, internationalized. So, uh, for instance, the, the 
halal meat, which uh, was something that everybody was uh, laughing about and so on and so forth. Uh, now it's a huge industry, right? And the same thing with the riba-based and the riba-free uh, financing. Now, they spoke English, right? So when we looked for scholars in the Indo-Pakistani uh, subcontinent, uh, they all spoke English, not only that, but they also mastered the Arabic language because they had to understand the Quran and understand the Hadith and the Sharia and all the sources of the law. So that was a fantastic source of uh, knowledge that we wanted to capitalize with. And when we got them with the international bankers, they could communicate, and that was the emergence of uh, what you see today at the movement. Any questions so far? No, thank you. No question. Okay. We talked about the English uh, language. Now, the third problem that we faced was the problem of cultures. Uh, the, uh, now, you have, you have uh, two main dimensions. The uh, Egyptian uh, Malaysian dimension, which was actually uh, related to Al Azhar University. And the Egyptians are uh, joke-loving, uh, fun-loving guys. You can see the Egyptians are easygoing and stuff. And then the Indian Pakistanis are very strict. You know, this has got to be this way. And, that, uh, and, and then the more difficult ones are actually the ones in the peninsula uh, who come from a desert background, and they are very strict, and they want to follow the Wahhabi uh, school of thought. Uh, and that had to do with the definition of what is allowed and what is prohibited, what is halal and what is haram. Or oh, from their from their research, they started they they started taking the work of Al Azhar scholars, and then uh, measuring it against their sources and making it a little bit harder. But, but the most difficult ones that, that were harder uh, were the Wahhabi school of thought. So that actually uh, produced two different bodies of scholarship. Scholarship in the Gulf countries that attracted, because in every school, in every seminar, there are the hardcore uh, people, the hardliners, and all the accommodating Liners. In a school, I mean, in this bank, you find the people who are very strict in, in lending and people who can, you know, be understanding, uh, people who take this line and, and that line. So, so those hardliners ended up in the Gulf countries, uh, Saudi Arabia and Dubai and so on. And then the more uh, accommodating ended up in Malaysia. So when the body of river free banking was developed in Malaysia, it was frowned upon by the scholars in the Gulf countries. But then as time went by, of course, the Malaysians developed a much faster and sophisticated riba-free system that was up to the standards of Europe and the United States, but the Gulf countries have been sitting there. And by the way, the last country to introduce riba-free banking in the world was Saudi Arabia, for your information. I mean, the last country, actually, they just made it uh, like eight years ago or ten years ago. But the only country that did not have that Islamic bank was Saudi Arabia. Why? I don't know. But, uh, but uh, again, it's uh, popular culture or knowledge. So anyway, but then uh, today uh, they are actually slowly converging. So now we are... Uh, very close to developing something that is universally accepted and uh, God willing will be a wonderful foundation for a better future. Um, um, in, uh, in Malaysia, actually, I, I also had the honor of, of uh, seeing a, a university which was supposed to be designed along the lines to it with Harvard and Yale and, and uh, some of the London School of Economics called INSIF, which is an international institute that uh, trains uh, riba-free bankers. And uh, they have students from 74 countries 
Uh, it's amazing when you go out and lecture there and see all of these people from all over the world. It's an amazing experience. Uh, so this also is coming, and, uh, and there is another center in Durham, England, uh, that's teaching this. So there, there, there is some uh, development. I think enough with this background, and we talked about the crossbreeding. And uh, okay. Now, what is jurisprudence? What is Sharia? Now, Sharia is translated as jurisprudence, which is a set of laws. But I, I, I think that it, it is. I prefer to translate it the law. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the Jewish uh, modern literature, they call the mosaic or the laws of Moses as the law and the laws of Jesus as the law. And I, I like to call the Sharia the Judeo-Christian Islamic law, or the law. Okay. Uh, now, the word Sharia is derived from the Arabic root, which means shara, or uh, introduced, or uh, has taken a certain road, a certain route, all right? or enacted or prescribed. It, uh, it, it has in it the spiritual beliefs and the applications of the religions as uh, divine from the Quran and imitable as based on the uh, tradition of Prophet Muhammad and all the prophets before him. So it tells a set of rules by which a, a Muslim believing in Islam lives. Uh, how he or she judged and governed, uh, including moral and legal uh, rulings uh, mandated by Islam, and it is the integration of all the laws sent by God through his prophets and the uh, prophet Muhammad. So there are two sources of the Sharia, the Quran, uh, and as a matter of fact, when you read the Quran, it really is, uh, and I have, like I said, I have been, I've taken a course at Fuller Seminary on the Bible, and I have attended a lot of uh, teachings of the uh, Torah, and you will find that the Quran really and truly is an inculcation of the, these two sources for those who like to read the Quran. And the best translation for those who would like to read, and I'll be glad to make it available, is the translation by Yusuf Ali who has uh, done it and acted it in uh, Oxford using Shakespearean translation. Why I say it's the best translation? Because in the footnotes, it has a tie-in, okay, whatever is in the Quran, how he ties it into the Torah revelations and the uh, Bible revelations. So for those who believe in the Bible, or those who believe in the Torah, they will be familiar and comfortable uh, reading these uh, translations. So it's, it's a great contribution to, to the future. It's, it's an amazing, this man, uh, for your information, he came from India, he lived in England, and when he died, he died uh, almost a homeless man. Uh, he did not have a uh, place even to live, he did not have the money for his burial, and I uh, happened to meet the man who helped bury him. So, uh, but he did a fantastic contribution in the translation of, uh, of the Quran. Um, this sounds like a, a Sunday uh, lesson, but I wanted you to know the foundation of this, so I, uh, those uh, who find it boring, please forgive me. Uh, it, it's not meant that way. So, uh, I will jump over the usul but here is, here is the, uh, the five levels by which one lives by. And by the way, not much different from the original uh, uh, Jewish uh, halakha or, or, uh, or uh, Talmud teaching. First one is required. Like prayers are required. A Muslim is required to pray five times a day in a certain way. That is wajib or required. It's exactly like you have to pay taxes. That is required by the American law. If you don't do that, you are violating the American law. <laughs> so there are required requirements. Uh, for instance, like fasting is required, all right? Uh, 
pick your arms or the cat is required. So that is the first category. The second category is uh, behavior that is recommended and encouraged and beloved. Uh, and it's pleasing to see you doing it. Uh, for instance, uh, after you pay your arms, which is required, if you want to pay more money to the needy, this is something we love to see, but not required, right? In other words, you can pay your taxes, and that's it. But if you want to give a donation, uh, if you want to do voluntary this and voluntary that, that is required. If you want to pray five times a day, and then you add ten more, you would say no, because it will uplift your spirits and so on. So this is something that you like. That's the second level. And then the third level, something that is allowed. Uh, for instance, uh, well, am I allowed to pray in the church or the mosque, or am I allowed to pray in the desert? Am I allowed to pray on the street? Am I allowed to pray? Yeah, it is allowed. You know, this is something that is allowed. Is it allowed uh, not to pay for the poor if you paid your zakat? Yeah, it's allowed. Nobody will complain about it. Mubah, yeah. You have that in this position, yeah. Uh, this is Mubah, all right? So uh, now, for instance, some people think that you have to dress in a certain way. You don't have to, you know, this is Mubah, it's allowed. Now, the fourth level, as you can see, you go from that extreme, right, to the other extreme. The extreme is divinely required, and the other extreme is divinely unlawful. Divinely required is halal, and divinely unlawful is haram, right? And that is uh, uh, stage of five. Now, hated or disliked, uh, disappointing, frowned upon, uh, for instance, um, if a young man looks at a girl, right? So uh, the first look is allowed, right? But more looks, <laughs> right? is hated, and, and and more and more looks is divinely unlawful. Is that clear, uh, <laughs> Abu Fattah Sokar? Because <laughs> 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 you, you are the oldest man in the crowd. Right? <laughs> <laughs> now, can we go over how many looks again? <laughs> I don't know why, and I'm not going to talk about that to you. Don't want to embarrass you. <laughs> All right, you see the concept? Do you, you see the concept, Daniel? So, so, so uh, there are things which are lawful, like, for instance, uh, drinking alcohol, intoxicants, unlawful, right? drugs, anything that takes away the power, your power, to be a human being, which is the power of judgment, the power of thinking, the power of reasoning, the power of knowing, because we know God not through our bodies, we know God through our minds, right? That is where our connection is with Almighty God. Do I make sense? Okay, so these are the five, and it, you know, they, they are very, uh, not unusual, it's very uh, interesting. Now, so the application of the Sharia actually uh, they are not only limited to worship rules, like for instance, this is the way you wash for the prayer, this is the way you pray, this is the way you marry. No, it has to do with uh, family law, for instance, marriage. And by the way, this is not much different from Judaism and uh, Catholicism. I know that uh, Patricia and her husband, they had to go to training classes in the Catholic Church for, I think, three or six months, right? She had to book and they go and they are taught about the, the values and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, this is not done. It, uh, this is done probably in the teachings in other uh, religions. Inheritance laws. How, how you distribute the inheritance after uh, the owner dies? If, if I die, uh, how much of my wealth will be distributed to my family? This is actually spelled to the decimal point in the Quran. Uh, commerce and trade, what the transaction laws, uh, for the first time, a whole body of transaction laws 
were developed for the first time in history for business transaction laws, which were borrowed by the uh, rabbi leadership in Eastern Europe to develop for the first time in history their own uh, uh, business uh, bodies of law, so on and so forth. Property laws, civil laws, criminal laws, the laws and regulations covering the administrative taxes, international relations, defense, peace, and ethics. Amazingly, <clears throat> I remember visiting my son-in-law, Rick, who went to law school at Yale. As you enter the Yale Law School, you will find the sources of law on the law school. It is amongst them the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran. I don't know if you know this or not. It's on the entrance of the law school at Yale. In the Supreme Court, uh, if you sit in the Supreme Court room, you will find the sources of the law, and one of them is a statue of Prophet Muhammad, uh, which includes in it, you know, the Quran and Prophet Muhammad, and of course uh, Jesus, and of course Moses, and the Torah, and the Jesus, and so on and so forth. What I'm trying to impress on you is that this wonderful country did not develop its laws out of vacuum. Its laws were developed based on the wonderful, vast human experience of all laws that were developed prior, including the Islamic Sharia. And that is something that the people of Oklahoma didn't know when they wanted to issue their uh, well-known, actually now defunct, um, the ruling that uh, Sharia is not acceptable and so on and so forth. Right? Any questions? No questions. No questions. Okay. Now, what are the fundamental goals of the law of Sharia? Very simple. Pushing away what is harmful and bringing in what's useful to you, your family, your community, and to the nation. And that's very simple. So it is not only the strict application of a certain religious law. No, the whole idea is what's good, bring it in, what's bad. Send it. I'll give you an example. For instance, if, if a, a, a customer calls me and says, Dr. Yahya, I like to do RF banking, and I don't know what to do because I can buy this car at a 0% interest, and I know there is interest in, into it, but you people are charging me 5% implied return. What should I do? I say, well, the most important fundamental of the Sharia or the Islamic law is pushing away what is harmful to your family and bringing in what's good. So you cannot harm your family trying to apply the Sharia. So if it is good for you, just go ahead and take it. And as long as you have searched the market for what is acceptable, and this is not good for your family, then go ahead and do it. Same thing with home financing, like somebody would call Ojiha, and Ojiha would tell him, here are the terms and the implied rate that I'm uh, giving you is 3.5%. Well, Wells Fargo is giving him 3%, and Wells Fargo is giving him no fees, and so on and so forth. So we either match it, or he comes to me for an opinion, I tell him, whatever is good for you and your family, supersedes the application of Sharia. So all of this talk and claim that living religiously should cost you money and you should pay for it, I personally don't subscribe for it because this is the most important fundamental of Sharia, of the law. Pushing away what's harmful in general and bringing in what's useful. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. Now, the second rule in the Sharia is if you cannot apply the Sharia fully, 100% in a Puritan way, that should not give you an excuse to abandon it. All right? For instance, if you have to live in a house and there is no river free banks, no river free financial institutions, then it is allowed for you go out and take a financing from a RIBA-based bank, right, until that facility becomes available, right? 
because living in a house can be a required necessity. You understand what I mean? For instance, if you are in the middle of a desert and you have no water, nothing, and the only available thing to quench your thirst is a bottle of wine, you can take a very small amount of it just to keep your life going until the alternative is available. And that brings in from the foundation, and that is pushing away what's harmful and bringing in what's good. So if you die, you will not be able to survive to improve the lives of your family members and those who live around you. Does it make sense? So uh, if you cannot achieve perfection 100%, is not an excuse for you to abandon it. So you can apply 10%, 20%, 30%, and hopefully one day, and you know, that's perfection. Perfection is only in God. Uh, then you can reach 90% to 95%. We're going to skip the meaning of fuck and so on. So now we want to translate uh, what we talked about into uh, how to apply the Sharia. Now, there are five categories. The first one is religion or deen or faith. That is the way of life. And then the second one is life. That is being alive. And the third one, that's family, including uh, your offspring, children, grandchildren, relations of kin. And then intellect, that's knowledge, and then wealth. So we got uh, one, two, three, four, five categories. And you can see wealth is at the bottom. So let us, let us talk about it. Wealth can be used to upgrade intellect. An intellect can be used to teach your children, and your children who are educated can live a better life, and when they live a better life, they conduct a better faith. You understand what I mean? And that's, these are the priorities. So your priority is not to accumulate wealth. The last priority you have is to accumulate wealth, because that wealth has to be used to improve intellect, going to school, the university, and so on, and family, and so on and so forth. <coughs> Dr. Raha, I have a question. Yes. Why would a way of life uh, have a priority over life itself? Oh, like, why would, uh, be, because uh, if, if you live as a slave, uh, you are a dead person who has a beating heart. So it is, it is your duty to get educated, to be intellectually capable, to understand what freedom is all about, then you can unlock yourself out of it, then you'll be, a, you'll be alive. You understand what I mean? No. <laughs> That's philosophy, I apologize. Uh, okay. Uh, Muhammad understands it and Alex understands. Rashida, do you understand? <laughs> So that's what I'm saying, right? Okay. A way of life or religion, is, 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 does that connote freedom then? Well, yeah, but, but that's the ultimate. The, uh, you, you need to, 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 to develop that. And I'll talk about it when we talk about... Hello? Yeah, yes. okay. Can you hear me? We'll talk about it when we reach the next stage, which is the matrix. And... Uh, so the ultimate is a faith-based capable community that upholds the faith, lives by the law of Islam. As a result, the faith will be held in the highest regards and attractive to many who would eventually accept it. I'll give you examples of the uh, Sharia. If you are in the desert, there is no water, and you want to watch for prayers, what do you do? So you apply the rules. What is the rule? We need to make sure that the faith is kept alive, which means that you have to pray to Almighty God. So if you don't have water to wash, then you use another technique, which is touching the sand and pretend as if there is water 
and then connect with Almighty God, and uh, so on. So, um, and then the scholars have divided it into uh, three categories, things which are required, daruriyat, like you have to drink water, this is required, right? And then complementary, well, you need to drink juice, you need to drink uh, Coca-Cola, you need to drink uh, uh, milk, but it's not required. The daruri, the required is water. And then complementary, which is called hajiyat, all right? And then improvements, which is tahsinat. In other words, instead of drinking uh, water and then milk, uh, people go and uh, drink pomegranate juice. Uh, this is really luxurious, right? Or, for instance, uh, you, need, uh, you need money to get on the bus to move from one place to another. That is a requirement. You have to have a means of transportation. But then you can say, well, I need a car which makes my, my life better. But then what kind of car? Well, you can have a smart car or you can drive a Mercedes, which is the real luxurious part. So the three levels of living, you understand what I mean? Uh, then uh, now we have two dimensions. Uh, and I want to uh, draw your attention to the matrix that they have on page 76 or 70. 72. Page 72. And I wish that uh, a whiz in, uh, in uh, linear algebra would model this on the computer because I want to develop a computer program which is used by all the muftis, the, the edict, edicts producers, would come in and you ask him about a religious opinion and he would say, well, I want to do this. And then he would ask you a set of questions and you put uh, weights, one, two, three, four, five, six, and you plug in one or two or three on the different aspects, and you push a button, you come up with a number, which can be, uh, really, I mean, if we could come up with, with a, a model like this, it would be a real revolutionary thing that could, uh, could uh, move people uh, 100 years in the front. But if you look at uh, page 72, you will find that uh, the priority, which is A and B and C, A, which is required, you have to, you have to, to cover yourself when you go out. Right? And then uh, complementary, which means if it is cold, uh, you can go with a light clothing. If you don't have anything else, you will not die, but you will need a sweater, which is complementary. And then uh, refined further, uh, that complementary can be a fear coat, you know, which is a very expensive thing, all right? So A, B, and C. And then on the uh, horizontal, level of the matrix, you will have the religion, the life, the family, and intellect and knowledge and wealth. And that is the matrix that I want to do. Some of the major centers of uh, research in the field. And by the way, there is one which is developing here, number of centers, but not focused on developing uh, religious edicts as much as research. The best two research universities in uh, the religion of Islam are Princeton and uh, Canadian University, McGill University. And Claremont, uh, McKenna here uh, in uh, Claremont, we actually started a, an Islamic studies department uh, which is thriving and growing slowly because we need a lot of money, but that also is developing to be an important uh, center. In addition to the other centers, and I hope that the RF uh, Institute for Banking and Finance will thrive and become bigger when uh, you all become professors in it uh, and teachers in your own right in, in what you do and what you do well. And, and I want to, 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 to remind you of what I said. There is no uh, uh, Buddhist, uh, Hindu, Jewish, or Christian, or Islamic influenza. Influenza is influenza, right? Uh, you, cannot, you cannot put a label on it. Now, how you treat it is what is different. Uh, in Vietnam, I'm sure when mom sees her son uh, having a cold, she treats him in a certain way, peculiar. 
in addition to the medicine and so on. Uh, in Sudan is different, in Pakistan is different, in America is different, in Ethiopia is different, right? So this is the way you treat it is uh, what is different. <laughs> now, then the other thing which is important is the uh, requirements for the person who should be on the board of uh, Sharia scholars, the advisory board of Sharia scholars. He's got to have mastery of the Quranic language and the Quran, knowledge, meanings, and historic reasons for the revelation of the verses of the Quran, education in the law uh, from a recognized university. Uh, and I list all of these things because it's very important. Knowledge of the Jewish Bible and the Christian Bible. This is preferred but not required, but this is, in my book, if you ask me, it is required. Because this way you can actually co communicate uh, and then proven analytical capabilities as witnessed by their professors and supervisors. Now, you can't come and tell me, oh, I just studied it on my own. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't count in my book because if you study it on your own, I need to examine you. Be another authority that will sit down and, and evaluate your knowledge and so on and so forth. Uh, knowledge of computers, uh, that's very important. What is your published research? Isn't that a question you need to ask? I mean, if somebody comes and says, well, I can tell you what is prohibited and what's allowed, what is halal and what's haram. Well, can you please point me to some of the published research that you have done? Isn't that a fair question? I mean, uh, tell me what you have done. I mean, you, you look good uh, as far as Hollywood is concerned, but uh, I want to know. I will say it this way because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But I want to know what you have published, what you have done. And then, of course, strong written and verbal and communication skills, uh, ability to speak in public, uh, good reputation in the community, uh, knowledge of family matters. I mean, you have to be married to be able to offer advice to uh, people about marriage. There was this girl here working in the pharmacy. I forgot her name, Heather. I mean, and uh, what are you doing, Heather? Well, I, I am a family uh, counselor, marriage counselor. Are you married? No, I'm not married. How, how, how can you give a counseling? Oh, I went to school. I was going to school is not enough. You have to, to live what you're offering advice on. Otherwise, it would be a, uh, a very uh, uh, theoretical advice. And then a track record of issuing fatwas, what you have done. Uh, I'm saying all this because in some countries nowadays, they, they graduate young men and women with the title Mufti. And, uh, so I've seen a Mufti at the age of 25, and right? I say, hey, come on, you know, give me a break. You'll be, you, please put down Mufti in training or a Mufti in preparation or something like that, because the Muftis that I'm aware of are at least 60 years old, 65 years old, who have been around, who have been uh, producing, you know, fatwas or edicts for a long time. And so on, I will let you read the rest of it. Now the question is, what is the role of the Sharia boards in an RF bank? Uh, they participate in hands-on training programs of the staff, uh, they supervise. Uh, this is the idea, day-to-day -day operations, make sure it is done right. Like for instance, if you have a sales force, you want to make sure that the sales force is not to try to sell with, without paying attention to saying the truth, right? Uh, you call people and say, well, oh, uh, the rate is going to be 3%, and the fact of the matter is much more than that because by the time you add costs, so, which is Regulation Z, all right? Making sure that Regulation Z is enforced, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, now, comes an important thing, and that is uh, uh, who to appoint uh, the upwards. There are two models used in appointing the Sharia boards in the RF banks. The model used by Malaysia, which I personally like a lot, what they had, they, the Central Bank of Malaysia uh, has two books uh, on its, on its uh, operation, one for RF banks and one for our river-based banks. Right? That's number one. And the number two, they have a board of scholars that would decide on the different products and services and what are the parameters used to make them compliant. 
make them RF compliant. And then each of the banks that are RF banks have a Sharia supervisor who would make sure that what the central bank says are compliant is done. I like this because you know it's like having an OCC and they come to the bank and what they do, they go to the compliance officer, in this case it's Alexandra, and they check their compliance to their claims. We are RF Bank, right? All right, now here's a compliance officer. Show me if you are complying or not. That, that's the thing. And it's, it's standardized, unified, universal, no problem. The other model which is used by the rich uh, oil producing countries, every bank has got its own board, all right? So they have uh, a board of uh, four or five, and frankly, they use the boards as a tool to market their products and services. Oh, and my board is X, Y, Z, so everybody will bring the money in. And, and, and most of the banks in these Gulf countries really and truly are owned by the rich and affluent of the community. Uh, so it, it really is a representation of the rich and affluent. It ended up that uh, in, in, in the Gulf banks, um, in the Shiavos, you find a scholar sitting on 70 banks' boards. Now, this fellow makes $100,000 a year. So this is a windfall for a poor uh, fellow who came from a village or something like that, but, but God, you know, to his knowledge, now he's making almost $7 million a year. Uh, now, he, now he's never been on an airplane, not only he's now on an airplane, but he's traveling first class. Uh, not only been into good hotels, but he's sitting in well different story and they work when he comes. So there is a, a quantum shift in the lifestyle. Why? Because there was a shortage in the scholars. Um, uh, uh, still is. But a new generation is coming out. Now, but then there have been a lot of concerns uh, voiced by Western Central Bankers because uh, they said, well, for every bank, we have a board of directors, and that is the highest authority in the operation of the bank under the shareholders. But now you are creating another board, which you call the Sharia board. Now, who is going to report to who? Isn't that an issue? It's a big issue because to the regulators, it is a board of directors, right? To, uh, to the regulators, a Sharia board really is not a banking expert board. It's, it's a board which is more religious. That's the first problem. The second problem is something that we have here in the United States that we guard very religiously, and that is the separation of church and state. Now, how can you, in a civil organization like this, you have the imposition of religion into uh, the process, and that is a concern they have. And, and, and that concern is still here in the United States, and that's why you don't find uh, too many RF banks. In England <clears throat> and Europe, because they need the funds, they need the liquidity, uh, and they are open, so fine, get whatever you need to do here. Um, I just want to give you an idea of the sizes, right? The, the size of all the Islamic banks in the world or RF banks in the world is almost one trillion dollars. Lehman Brothers, which is a small little peanut of the whole investment banking industry in America, when it folded, you know how much it was? $680 million. So, so what, what, what you're talking about, I mean $680 billion. So what you're talking about, you're talking about a very small uh, fraction of the no, $680 million versus uh, $1 billion in the size of the Islamic Bank. I said trillion, which I'm wrong. $1 billion for the Islamic banks and $680 million, which is almost three quarters of a billion dollars. So it's a very small uh, industry. The, the reason people are attracted is it has a lot of liquidity, uh, over 50%, 60 70 sometimes. Cash, you don't know what to do with, and that's why people want to reach to it. So my my vision of to, to resolve this is very simple, and that is um, and that is simply uh, to have 
during the annual examination for safety and soundness of the OCC will add another item, which is actually a consumer compliance item. You claim that you are an F RF bank to the public, right? Now, here is an examination for RF banking. I want to, sh to see what are the products and services, how you pr present the products and services, how you calculate this and that. And it's very simple. It's, really, it's much simpler than it is presented uh, in Europe. And the reason it is simpler is because we understand how the system works. So you know how to work within the system as compared to people who come from uh, mainly the oil producing countries who did not have a system, actually. I, I am told that uh, safety and examination uh, exam, uh, safety and, and, and soundness exam is done within a half a day. Just a person comes from the Treasury Department for half a day, sits down, have some coffee with the chairman, get some numbers and go. That's essentially it. So they can change the laws if they want. They can change the rules if they want. But here we represent the uh, fruits of uh, human toil and experience and hard work for years, not only of America, of Europe, of uh, old uh, societies, 